Hi, I'm Pastor Angie Lynch with The Truth Driven Life, and today we had a special service. My pastor, Pastor Earl Gardner, was here today, and he gave a message on, you stepped in what? So, come on in, take a look. Thank you. Last night I didn't get an applause. <laughs> it's good to see you again. We had a... I think we had a good time last night at our, at our workshop, and I think a lot got accomplished. I'm looking forward to teaching you again today. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us. Holy Spirit, we welcome you as our teacher. We welcome you to bring us insight, to bring us freedom, to bring us strength, and bring us closer to you. We welcome you to do what you do so well. Let's set people free. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. And amen. I want to uh, just tell Angie how much I appreciate her and her ministry. The Bible says you, um, <clears throat> you'll know them by their fruit. And that's how you judge someone is through the fruit, you know. And the fruit that I have seen produced is just amazing. And along with that comes a lot of persecution. And I know that's just part of bearing the fruit. But Angie touched a lot of lives. And they'll never be the same. And just keep doing what you're doing. Because it's working. You got to God, your God is just setting people free for you. Okay. All right. I want to review what we went over last night, and nothing wrong with review. And then I want to go from there into what I'm teaching on today. All right. I asked you the question: Why does the Bible contradict itself? And uh, that surprises a lot of people to. Uh, to even find out that the Bible does contradict itself. We have a mindset, oh my God, no, it, it, it can't contradict itself. It's the Bible. The Bible is perfect. It's written by God. Well, the truth is there's over 200 contradictions in the Bible. That's a lot of contradictions. And God being God, I mean, he's the one that made a mosquito. He's the one that made a, a butterfly. He made everything so perfect. Why would he allow contradictions in this book that you and I are supposed to study and base our life on. We're, we are supposed to go to this book, this uh, manual, and 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 find out how to raise our children, find out how to treat my wife, find out how to how to be a person. But there's contradictions, and I am a manual reader. When I put something together, I will read the manual. Most people don't; they just tear the manual and throw it away, or you know. But I like to read manuals. I don't know why. And some of them are written in Chinese, believe it or not. I can't read those. Some of them are very confusing. And what I have found out as a student of the Bible since 1984, the Bible can be very confusing. It can say one thing on one page and two pages later, something <coughs> just the opposite. Sometimes in the same verse. What is this? Why does the Bible contradict itself? Well. We found out last night that uh, there's a reason. And I want to give you an example of that. In Matthew 19, 19, the Lord says, Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So what are we supposed to do? Honor mom, honor dad, love neighbor, and love self. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Why not just leave that alone? I mean, we hear that all the time. We, you know, love your neighbor as yourself, love your neighbor as yourself, love your parents. Okay, but here's the same Jesus, same Jesus, in Luke 14, 26, he says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children, it's not hard to do sometimes either, you know that? <laughs> and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life, he even says, now I want you to hate you. He cannot be my disciple. When I pastored, that, that scripture 
I, it drove me nuts. I, I just didn't get it. And several years ago, I got it. I saw the depth of what he was saying. So why is this happening over and over in the Word of God? Well, God has done it on purpose. God's intention is for there to be tension. Say tension. <laughs> Last night we went into more, you know, some depth, depth of what tension was, and there's tension everywhere. The whole universe is full of tension. You cannot build something, carry something, sit on that chair. You cannot do anything without tension. And I, uh, I asked my wife to come up here last night. I'm going to ask her to come up here again real quick. Okay. And why do we have this tension? Okay. What's the reason? Why would there? Come on, this time. Okay. And I use the example of a relationship that when you first get together with somebody, we've been married 22 years, and we just skip through life together, and we're happy every day, right? <laughs> Right. Right. No. What happens after the honeymoon is over? What's What happens? We're just going through life. We're so excited to be together. And then all of a sudden, what happens? Boom. It's like, whoa, what was that? What was that? Have you noticed in every relationship, every, every marriage, there's tension? And it doesn't seem to go away, does it? As a matter of fact, what can happen over time is that tension can become stronger and stronger and stronger to the point that the relationship breaks away. Now what I, what I was teaching last night, that God has intended, what I'm teaching right now, He's intended this tension to be there. And I gave you an analogy of this, this rope here that each one of these fibers, this one here represents what? Finances. This one represents how, we, how I read. Do I need to see something? Is there something I don't see? Because what I believe I really believe I'm right. And guess what she believes? <laughs> that I'm right. Huh? And how right do I believe it? <clears throat> to that degree. Yes, but what we normally do, we just scream and scream and scream at each other. Not we don't normally do that. That's what people do because they don't know what to do with this tension. The tension is the indication of something needs to be talked about, something that needs to be worked through, or something needs to be seen that one of us don't see. And I shared last night, and, and all, honestly, most of the time, I'm coming to her and saying, wow, I apologize, I'm sorry. I did not see that. I did not see that that hurt you. I did not see that I was doing that. I did not see that I was, you know, da 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 And about once or twice a year, she comes to me and says, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so there's a purpose for tension. Why? All right. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus said, I will send you the comforter. He said, right before he left, went to heaven, he said, I'm going to send you the comforter. The comforter is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is now, he is here, taken, he has taken Jesus' place, and the purpose for him is to lead us and guide us into all truth. And when I said, well, I, go, I said, I go to him in prayer, that's who I go to. I'm showing you what this looks like. I go to the Holy Spirit. I say, Lord, show me. Enlighten me. This is what Christianity looks like. This is what Christian growth looks like. You having a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, most of us have a relationship with the Word of God. Nothing wrong with that, but it's a big, big, big difference. A relationship with the Word of God, you're going to end up living a life of principle, a life of rules instead of a relationship where God can show you what that particular scripture means for you. You know, this scripture might not apply to you at all, but it has, it, I'm not based my whole ministry on it. Because in prayer one night, he showed me, Earl, boom, this is why I called you. And yet, someone else over here, their ministry looks totally different, totally different flavor, because they had a night or an evening where they, the Holy Spirit said to them, boom, this is what you're called to do. You're called to help women, homeless. Okay, You're called to feed the poor. You're called to do this. You're called to go out to all the world and preach the gospel. So you, you can see that, that through the Spirit of God speaking to us individually, that's where growth takes place. Now, what's Christianity without that relationship with the Holy Spirit look like? It looks like law. 
it looks just like a law and death no the bible says you got to do this no bible says you got to do this no we can't have women preachers no we can't have women teachers know the bible says this bob says that bob says this hey that's death that's death the problem is you can prove it in the bible anything you want to believe you can prove you can pull it out of the bible and you've got your doctrine but where'd you get it from you got it from your comfort zone you got it from your past you got it from your ideas you got it from whatever you come up with when you when you began okay i was raised southern baptist i did not believe in speaking in tongues i did not believe in the baptism uh, baptism of the holy spirit i was raised under the law and one night i got, came head on front i mean bam with the holy spirit and guess what he did he baptized me in something i'd never heard of before in my life I was speaking in a heavenly language that I'd never heard of before in my life. It totally transformed my life. That was my experience with him. Now, other people have not had that experience, and it's okay with me. But that was my experience, and it's still my experience today. So why is there tension? Okay, why didn't he make it just rule? Why didn't he have the ten ways? To, why doesn't the Bible say the ten ways to raise your kids? 18 ways to take care of your husband. The 55 ways to take care of your wife. Did y'all get that? <laughs> why, 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 why are the rules not ready, written? Because it's not about keeping the rules. It's about your relationship. And when you build a relationship with the Holy Spirit, listen, you can't have a relationship with the Holy Spirit unless you're born again. You can't. You have to be born again. You have to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Then He will introduce you to, in, to Him. And then that relationship, okay? You say, okay, Earl, you talk to the Spirit every day? Oh, constantly. Constantly. I will not buy something without confronting Him. I, I won't spend money. Now, what is it? Is it a conversation? No, it's a thought process. That over time it's developed. It's what Paul called walking in the Spirit. Or walking with the Spirit. And it has developed over time. To where you check with him enough times and you'll see that he will lead you to the right people. He will, he will lead you to stay away from certain people. He will lead you to the right books. To the right whatever you need in life. Your purpose in life. He'll lead you. He wants to. That's why Jesus died on the cross, okay? So the Comforter has been sent, and he is a part of our life now. And you might say, well, I don't believe this. I, I don't believe this. I just, I don't believe there should be tension. I believe it should be all about love. That's an awesome thing to believe. But Christianity is not all about what you think love is. Let me show you this scripture right here. Matthew 10, 34. Our same Jesus, okay, who gave his life and died for the sinners on this earth. Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, against his daughter, against his mother, against his daughter-in-law, against her mother-in-law. I came here to put you against each other. Jesus said that. See, the, the, we're not Buddhist. We got the wrong religion if you're trying to walk in pure love and pure acceptance. That's the wrong religion. Christianity, you, you have grace in one hand and you have a sword in the other hand. <laughs> it's not for weak people. We've made it weak. What happened when Jesus found the money changers in the temple? What did he do? He went home and built a freaking whip. <laughs> and what did he do? He took it to church. And he literally wham, ran him out of there. And if you read the Greek, it's interesting how the words that are used of his anger, how mad he was. Jesus mad? Yes, Jesus was very angry. Because you can't have pure love without anger. 
and I'm not going there. Okay. All right, you should have been here last night. His, tension, his, his intention is to put you and I in tension. Now, I've got proof. How many of you live a life without tension? Not one of you. Every one of you have tension. A lot of it. Well, maybe it's God there. And that tension, if we don't know what to do with it, what happens? It, it, it'll pull marriages apart. It pulls relationships apart. It pulls friendships apart. It, it pulls churches apart. Because we don't know what to do with this tension because we don't think it's supposed to be there. And only through tension can there be a real relationship. Our relationship of 22 years, our relationship is very strong, but it is the tension that has built that relation because, uh, let me show you this next picture. I love this next picture. Okay? Sonia's favorite picture. <laughs> <laughs> The physics of tension is uh, achy muscles after a workout are due to micro tears in muscles that occur when you put tension or stress on them. Even our body needs tension. Lots of it <laughs> for some of us, okay? But what does the tension do? What does it do? The tension makes you stronger. It builds the muscle. The more you can tear, the stronger you get. The more you can tear, the stronger you get. The more you can get on your knees, the more you can search, the stronger you get. Patty, have you ever noticed that in your, in your arguments nothing ever gets done? Nothing. Now that leads me to today's teaching. That was yesterday's teaching. And the title of my teaching today is You Stepped in What? Bet you never heard that preached on Sunday morning. <laughs> when Lou Ann and I first got married, we live in Tyler, Texas, and we, we signed up for a, a dance class at the University of Tyler. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, what did we do? We took uh, swing dancing. They offered swing, it all in one package. It was swing dancing, wall scene, cha cha cha, and, and uh, yeah, country western. <laughs> and, uh, Man, we suck at the country and western. <laughs> we really do. Uh, but we had a good time. They played this song. Y'all ever heard this song? Come on, people. No? Okay. Well, that's a song, and, it, and, and, and it's a uh, it's a country west song, and it says, You stepped in what? And everybody hollers something. Okay? And I can't say it this morning because we're in church. But it, the Hebrew word for it is parash. Say parash. 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 All right? That's Hebrew for dung. That's the English word in the Old Testament, all throughout the Old Testament. Dung, what we call manure. Okay? And the Bible has a lot to say about it. Believe it or not. This right here is called a dung hill. This picture that you're looking at. Uh, we, we actually, uh, we have, I have 20 cows, Luann has 30 chickens, we have two cats, we have two dogs, and we have a lot of poop around our house. <laughs> a lot. We live on a little farm, and uh, you, you just can't live on a farm without dealing with dung and being in dung constantly. Now you city people, you go, oh my God, that's terrible. Well, let me show you something that's very interesting. All right. A lactating dairy cow can produce 150 pounds of manure every day. Wow. Now that's a lot. 150 pounds every day. We have we had a dairy a dairy across the street from us. They had 400 cows. That's 60,000 pounds of manure every day. That's a lot. There are actually laws on what dairy farms farmers can do have to do with the manure because it is a problem. What do you do with 60,000 pounds of manure every day? If the wind was out of the west, which wasn't very often where we lived, oh my God. Oh my God. I mean, we got the full brunt of the dairy farm. And uh, the, the guy that ran the uh, dairy, we were good friends, his name was Ben. And one day Ben was over at our house and, and uh, he was visiting and the wind shifted. And this smell, just while we were standing there, just went. And, and I went, oh, there it is. And you know what Ben did? He went, money. 
Oh, <laughs> it changed my perspective completely, okay? All right. Uh, 20 broiler chickens will produce over 4 pounds a day. That's a lot. Luann has 30. So she gets at least 4 pounds of manure every day. What do you do with all this? What do you do with this mess? Well, at that dairy farm, they had a pond that when they called the cows in to milk them, they would be eating and feeding them, all right, and the cows would be pooping. Well, they had a system, a washout system, to where all the poop would wash into this pond. And this pond is not a pond you want to swim in. I mean, it is just, you can't walk because it's just, it's like quicksand. And one day Ben came over, Earl, do you have a Coke bottle? And I, I mean, Ben had a, a, a plastic apron on, and he is up this high, all over his face, covered in dung. I mean, wet, fresh dung. He had it all over his pickup truck. He comes flying out of there, and there's this dung flying everywhere. And I, and I go, Ben, where you been? <laughs> he said, oh, I had a calf that got into the pond, and I had to go in there and get it. He said, you got a Coke bottle? I said, yeah, I got one. So I ran, got him a Coke bottle. <laughs> and I said, what are you going to do with that? He said, oh, if I don't get this medicine down this calf, he said, it's going gonna, it's gonna to die. And so what they do, they put this medicine in the Coke bottle. He takes his hand and he shoves it down to the calf's stomach and, and empties the Coke bottle and pulls the Coke bottle out to save the calf. But dung meant, it meant nothing to, to Ben. Are you all with me? It meant nothing to him. And my analogy today, and why I'm talking about this, because dung and sin are exactly the same. Did you hear me? How many of you know that dung has a smell to it? Does dung have a smell to it? Come on. Yeah. Yes, it stinks, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, sin stinks also. Do you know that sin has a smell to it? It really does. Now the problem with us, Luann and I living on the farm, we're around it all the time and so guess what happens? We don't smell it. We're used to it. Ben can swim in it. <laughs> and many people are the same way with sin. Your heart gets hardened. Your heart gets hardened to the things of God. You can't hear Him. You can't hear your friend. You can't hear the preacher. You can't hear me right now. Why? Because you stink. You've forgotten what repentance is. You've forgotten what being right with God is. You've forgotten with, with what confession of your sins... I'm talking to Christians. Is. Being right in the relationship... And, and it, I'm a little worried nowadays because it just doesn't seem like anything's sin anymore. And you guys have known me for a long time, and I don't preach on sin. But I'm a little concerned. Everything's okay. Even lying. Christians lie all the time. They call it a white lie. It's a white lie. It, I, I think it's one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not what? Lie. Thou shalt not what? Lie. Lie. <laughs> Thou shalt not. It, no. No. Don't break this law. Don't lie. Well, well, it's a white lie. It's a little lie. Well, how would it work if I came home to my wife and said, I just touched her lightly. <laughs> it was a light adultery. That wouldn't fly, would it? No. See, we get around sin and we just, all of a sudden, it just becomes a part of us and we begin to stink and, and we have Christians lying and they stink. There's, there's no growth. And with, with that alone, you cannot have a relationship with them. Are you listening to me? There's no relationship with someone who's in sin. Sorry. Now, if you hang around them, guess what's going to happen? You're going to smell just like them. Tough message this morning, but it's the truth. <clears throat> this is the pond across the street. 
notice the big tractors in the back that one particular tractor has a huge huge pump okay this pump uh, it pumps these ponds out two or three times a year and they have they put all this manure in these huge tanks and, they, and it has uh, a system to where it can spread it all over the pasture about four five six seven I think uh, maybe 800 acres okay and it, it just it's like a fertilizer it's a fertilizer and guess what that pasture smells like on those days that they do that it really really does stink it's nauseating unless you're used to it if you came to visit me on the day that they did this you would have to go in the house and like turn the air conditioner on because it's nauseating but the people that are around it it's no big deal that's dangerous people do you know that do you know what I'm talking about it doesn't hurt to watch this movie it doesn't hurt to do this it does, oh, no. it's, just, it's just a little bit of nudity I'm not preaching against anything I don't preach against anything what you do I don't care what you do personally I don't care. I honest to God don't care. I'm just preaching the Word of God. And it's your business what you do with it. It's your business how stinky you want to be as a Christian. Now the spraying is the analogy of the world. The world, the media, the spraying because it's everywhere today. Everything is okay, 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 okay. And you're getting sprayed with it and not taking it a bath. Some of you. And we're becoming. And that's the goal. Deceived. Because the deceiver, the same guy that tripped up, lied to, deceived a third of heaven, a third of the angels who knew God. These angels knew God. These Christians know God. Being Christian does not mean you cannot be deceived. No, he's good. He's very good. That's his name, the deceiver. And one of the, one of the ways he deceives is to get you isolated, to get you alone, to get you away from the body of Christ, to get you away from people that will tell you the truth. If he can isolate you, you're pretty much gone. Truthfully. And what does an isolated Christian look like? Well, it's not pretty. Pastors fall into adultery, adulterous affairs, uh, gamble, gambling. I worked with a pastor one time to help him get out of his situation when he was in Las Vegas. He uh, every Sunday he gambled the offering. <laughs> every Sunday, from straight to church to the casino. We fall into all kinds of different deception, and that's why we need so we need each other so much. I like what one preacher said: "Who holds your sit down and shut up card? Who can say to you, sit down, and shut up? You need to hear this. You're fixing to mess your life up. Who holds that card for you in your life? Is there anybody?" And sometimes we need that. That's why we need the relationships. All right. This is the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was writing to the Corinthians church who had a lot of manure going on. It's interesting. I mean, they were full of manure. And he says, For though I made you sorry with the letter that I wrote, I do not regret it. In other words, he wrote him a real nasty letter. He said, Though I, re uh, though I but, uh, but I did regret it, for I see that the letter I wrote made you sorry. In other words, I really hurt your feelings, though but for a season. You might not like this message today. Guess what? You'll get over it. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you were made sorry unto repentance. His letter took them to a place to where they got on their knees and said, Oh my God, we smell like dung. We need to, to get right with God. And so they repentance. Say repentance. Repentance. I gotta insert this in here real quick last night. I was working with a young lady, and, and this happens a lot, where she caught her husband, okay, she caught her husband doing this and that and that and that. And he, he he said he was sorry. That is not repentance, people. Saying you're sorry is not repentance. Repentance looks like something. 
repentance, <laughs> you know when you see repentance. And you can't do with anything with a Christian who is non-repentive. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. If a Christian is non-repentive in what they're doing, all you can do is let God take them down. That's it. And He will. Alright, He says, For you were made sorry after the, uh, the godly sort. So there's a, there's a godly sort that you might suffer loss by us in nothing. He said, For godly sorrow worketh repentance. When you're sorry about something, it works repentance. Not confession. Repentance. It's a, there's a big difference. Oh God, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I lied. How many of you ever felt that feeling of when you did something wrong? It's it's not it's wrong it's it's ugh ugh it's a terrible feeling when you've done something wrong, <laughs> and I've felt that feeling many times, people. <laughs> For godly sorrow work with repentance unto salvation, a repentance which bringeth no regret. I'm so glad I did it. Why? Because now I'm free. He said, but the sorrow of the world will take you right to death. Do you realize that you can repent and go straight to death? And death in life? Death in, with no life? Be a dead man walking? <laughs> yes. And that's why this relationship that we were teaching on last night is so important that we have this relationship with the Lord to constantly check. Constantly, it is a relationship that we constantly check, constantly check our relationship with Him. Even in communion. That's when I was taught as a little boy. That's when you did it. This is my dog. His name is Max. He's one of the poopers at our house. Okay. <laughs> Max is a phenomenal dog. Um, when we got Max, he's eight years old right now. He, he, he messed on our house one time as a puppy. We went over and said, Max, we don't do this. Okay. No. We took him outside. And he's never done it again. It's a good dog. And it was about that. It was that easy to teach him. He's a great, uh, what is he? A giant schnauzer. He's a giant schnauzer. And I love Max. Love, 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 love Max. And every morning I have a routine, okay? I go into the bathroom, I get my electric toothbrush, and I put stuff on it, and I walk through the house, and, and I walk, okay, we have, a, we have a, uh, a dining table right here, and we have three blinds, maybe four, that I open up every morning, okay? And I'll walk between the dining table, and I'll, you know, and I do this routine, and I go do some other things while I'm brushing my teeth. All right. And the other morning, and I'm in my, you know, shorts, no shirt on. This is my home. And 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 and, and so I, I walk in, and and I'm doing my little routine. I'm barefooted, and all of a sudden, oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! I honestly, my toothbrush is like, I just wanted to, no, no, that's not what I think it is. It comes between my toes. It's like the smell hit, and that's the worst smell in the world is dog dung, okay? And I'm like, oh my God, what do I do? And, and Max is laying on the ground looking at me with his little thing, hands out, and he's just looking at me. And I wonder, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you say something? But yeah, I know he can't. So I, I hop out. I hop out to the front yard. It's cold. It's cold. I didn't care. And I grabbed the, the you know, the hose, and I just started squirting as fast as I could. And I'm in, in the bushes, I'm rubbing my toes, trying to get it out between my toes. I'm going, ugh, ugh, ugh. You know? Cause I can't stand that smell. Why didn't Max tell me? <laughs> well, first of all, he can't. But second of all, there's no relationship there. Do you know what? As brothers and sisters in Christ, we are to be like, warning, warning, warning. Hey, warning. Don't brothers protect their sisters and vice versa? I had a big sister that protected me all the time. <clears throat> And I would fight for her too. But when we all smell like dung, nobody's doing anything wrong, are they? Maybe it's time for a, a revival of repentance to come through the, 
the body of Christ again. Now, I'm not talking about holiness. I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about just getting a few things back in tra on track that, yeah, yes, it's grace. Yes, there's mercy, but my God. Maybe we're getting a little bit too far. Maybe. And that's between you and him. It's not for me to judge. It's not for you to judge. Okay? Someone else. Mm -hmm. But this is what we've done. Isn't that pretty, <laughs> that's pretty poop, isn't it? It's pretty poop. I have uh, worked in the past uh, as a counselor the last 20 years. I've worked with uh, a lot of affairs situation, male and female. Christians, non-Christians, ministers, mm -hmm. okay, come in to the office, and and it, it's shocking how some are so repentive. They got that nauseating, uh, uh, sickening, I've done wrong. And others come in with arrogance. It's all his fault. It's all her fault. If they, if he would have spent more time with me, if he would have taken me out more, if she would have had sex with me more. They, 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 they try to make their poop smell good. Look good. And it's everybody else's fault. And one thing you'll see is the cutting off. When a Christian gets into deep sin, they will cut off everyone around them. Yep. We could be screaming, screaming, screaming. And that's where it's so hard just to sit back and watch. And I've watched many people just... Okay. I had a young man one time come into my office. Came in. He's five minutes late. Wanted to save his marriage. I met with him for a few minutes. And I said, young lady, I will meet with you again. Young man, I don't ever want to see you again. And he was shocked. He's a big old, strong, burly guy. He said, well, what, what, what do you mean? I said, if you're five minutes late to a meeting to save your marriage, you're not that concerned. He said, oh, okay. I said, I don't want to work with you. He called me later and he apologized. He said, you know, you're right. I want to fix this. Today they have one of the strongest marriages I know. Because he came, she came, they repented of their sins. Repentance, true repentance takes time. Mm -hmm. It takes work on self. It takes finding out what got you in that situation to begin with. It takes inner healing. True repentance does. It's not, I'm sorry I didn't had I had an affair and and I'll never do that again. That's not repentance. Are you with me this morning? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Confession and apologies is not repentance. It's not. Like I said, in working with people, you know who wants to get their life right. You know who wants to get the dung off of them. You know who wants to change. I do. I do, I do, I do. How do I know? There's eagerness. There's desire. There's no excuses for not coming to a, a meeting, a session. There's no excuses for missing a therapy session. They want to to read the book that you hand them. They want to listen to the CD or the tape that you give them. They want to grow. True repentance, the person truly wants to change. Confrontation that requires repentance is so important because of self-deceiving nature of sin. Us, the rest of the body of Christ, should we confront? Yes, we should confront. Will it cost you a friendship? You're going to lose the friendship anyway. Did you hear me? Mm -hmm. What do I mean by confront? Oh, uh, you're drinking a beer. You shouldn't drink a beer if you're a Christian. And that's not what I'm talking about at all. That's, that's, that's just being judgmental. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when somebody is in sin, sin, sin. And you know it's destroying their life. It's destroying their family. It's destroying their finances. <coughs> it's destroying their relationship. Does con confrontation work? Usually not. just depends on how much of a hold Satan has on that person. But no matter what we do, if we do confront, we confront in love. 
Meaning, I am not here to condemn you. I am not here to judge you. I am here to point out to you that I love you, and I don't want you to. I don't want to see you live this way. It's so beneath you. And that's about all you can say. Are you with me? All right. I want to close today by giving every person the opportunity to know the Jesus that I know. When I was nine years old, I was in a Baptist church, very shy, very, very shy, you little boy. It was a big church. And a pastor stood up and he talked about going to heaven. I thought, I want to go to heaven. I really want to go to heaven. I just wanted to. And he told, he stood up there and said, if you come up here, I'll show you how to go to heaven. And as shy as I was, I got up. And I said a little prayer. And I gave my life to Jesus. I got born again. It was that simple. And I found out later, I really didn't even have to go down there. That I could have been born again sitting in my chair. And those of you that are listening, you can be born again sitting in your living room. Through a simple little prayer. What is the prayer? Lord, I accept you as my Savior. I accept you that you died for my sins. I accept you, Father. I don't understand it. I don't know anything about the Bible. I mean, it doesn't even have to be this way. I just accept you, Lord. But whatever you need to say to Him. And that's the beginning. The beginning of a relationship with Jesus Christ. I look back and think of that day as one the most important day of my life. I'll never forget it. And that's why I want to give you the same opportunity I have. Because I believe it would be your most important day. What do you do after that? Don't worry about it. Just say the prayer. He'll show you. He'll lead you. Well, I don't want to become religious. And then neither do I, okay? I don't like religion. But I love the relationship. And I love the knowing where I'm going. Are you with me? So let's close our head. No, I mean, let's close our heads. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. And I'm just going to ask all of you to say this prayer with me. Just repeat it. If you don't want to, that's fine. Just, Heavenly Father, I come to you. And I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I accept your Son. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, that He died on the cross, on the cross for, me for me and the rest of the world. And, the of the world. and I thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. And it is that simple. The Bible says, believe. <coughs> Say believe. 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 That's it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Believe. That's it. So simple. If it's not simple, it's not.